Welcome everybody to US-Japan Council's third and final webinar in our three-month Japan Perspective Series, The Global Digital Transformation and Workforce Trends Impacting the United States and Japan. I'm Suzanne Basala, President and CEO at the US-Japan Council. First, to cover some logistics, this session will be conducted in English, but Japanese interpretation is available by clicking on the globe icon at the bottom of your screen. Now, for those of you who are new to us, the US-Japan Council develops and connects global leaders to create a stronger US-Japan relationship. We're an organization whose members believe people-to-people -people relationships are a powerful way to bring together leaders in the United States and Japan to address and create solutions to mutual concerns. And you can learn more by visiting our website at the URL that's in the chat box. Now, of course, today's session would not be possible without our sponsors. I would like to offer our sincere appreciation to our platinum sponsors, Babbitt and the Ford Foundation. I would also like to thank our title sponsors, the Aritani Foundation, Central Pacific Bank Foundation, Hitachi, Itoen, Mitsui, MUFG, Terasaki Nibe Foundation, and the Toyota Research Institute. I'd also like to thank our signature sponsors, which you can see displayed on this slide. We're so grateful for their support and helping make programming like this possible. And to the many companies and individuals who make up our premier sponsors, we recognize their generosity. We're proud of this diverse group of supporters and truly we couldn't be here without them. Today's discussion could not be more topical. You know, four years ago, I moved from Washington, DC and my experience in government and nonprofit organizations to come here, I'm currently in Mountain View in Silicon Valley, where I joined the Toyota Research Institute, one of our, our key sponsors. As a Silicon Valley tech company that was competing for and is competing for software engineers and top AI machine learning global talent, the culture and the environment at TRI was unlike anything I had ever experienced in the bowels of the Pentagon or in the DC office suites. At the same time, I was part of one of the most massive traditional Japanese companies, Toyota, and that was another distinct work culture. So as a result of my experiences in government nonprofit, Silicon Valley and working for a Japanese company, I've become quite aware of the impact of workforce trends on culture in different kinds of organizations and in both countries. And that was well before COVID-19 accelerated digital transformation of our workplaces and exposed us to new opportunities to collaborate remotely, as well as new challenges to bringing our best selves to the job. So I am eager to hear the insights from our distinguished speakers. So now I'd like to introduce our moderator for this dialogue, Eric Heenan. Eric is USJC council leader based in Hawaii and president of Ala Kai Executive Search, a recruiting firm that identifies and secures talented leaders and executives for the Hawaii job market in a variety of industries. Prior to founding Alakai Executive Search in 2017, Eric spent the last 20 years working in executive search and IT sales in Japan, where he supported clients across numerous industries, including technology, finance, and manufacturing. We're delighted to have him moderate today's discussion on the global digital transformation and workforce trends impacting US and Japan. Eric, take it away. Thank you, uh, Suzanne, uh, so much for the warm introduction. Uh, good morning to our friends in Tokyo and a uh, good afternoon and good evening to those on this side of the ocean. Uh, it is such an honor to moderate uh, today's discussion. And uh, let's jump right in and introduce our esteemed panelists. Uh, first, we have Wei Ku, who is a partner at PwC Japan and leads the Capital Markets Accounting Advisory Services Group. He specializes in assisting clients in resolving complex accounting and financial reporting issues. Wei spearheads PwC's Japanese business network, where he is responsible for client relationships and engagements for the Americas region. He is also the global relationship partner for a multinational consumer and retail company headquartered in Japan. Wei started his career with PwC back in 1991 in the US and localized back to Japan in 2016. 
He has vast global experience from working in the UK, China, Singapore, Korea, Taiwan, and Japan. Wei holds a bachelor's degree in economics from Albright College in Pennsylvania and is a US certified public accountant. He is fluent in English, Japanese, and Chinese Mandarin. Welcome, Wei. Thank you for joining us. Next is Akiko Naka, the founder and chief executive officer of Wantedly, a social networking service for professionals. Following its lo official launch in February of 2012, Wantedly grew to 3 million users and 37,000 companies and has become the leading social networking service in Japan. Prior to Wantedly, she was a growth coordinator at Facebook Japan and in equity sales at Goldman Sachs. She graduated from Kyoto University in 2008 with a BA in economics and has certainly put that degree to good use. Welcome, Akiko. Last thank you for but having certain, me. Yeah, thank you. Last but certainly not least is Maiko Todoroki, the president of Poppins Corporation and Poppins Holdings, Inc. The company was founded in 1987 by her mother, and its mission is to support working women and is recognized as a premier childcare and senior care company in Japan. Poppins IPO to the first section of the Tokyo Stock Exchange in December of 2020 was presented as the first SDGs IPO in Japan. Congratulations. She is a member of the Industrial Structure Council of the Ministry of Economy trade and industry, and a member of the Japan Association of Corporate Executives. She is a regular speaker at key conferences regarding childcare and women's leadership and family business. Prior to joining Poppins, Maiko started her career with Merrill Lynch International in London, and then moved to the luxury goods industry, first with Chanel Corporation in Paris and Tokyo, and then Graf Diamonds and later De Beers Jewelers in London. Michael holds an MBA from INSEAD and a Bachelor's of, of Arts in French and Management from King's College London. Michael spends her free time with her family and two children and is an avid global traveler. Welcome, Michael. Thank you so much for joining today. And uh, Wei, yeah, great to see you again. Uh, Wei, you have the honors of uh, answering the first question. We will start with you today. Um, so question one. Uh, PwC has done extensive research uh, based on various surveys from employees and employers uh, on the changes they expect to see in the workforce. Uh, can you please give us some highlights from that report? Okay, thank you, Eric. Uh, so yes, I'll take away that question. Um, and I was saying, um, when remote work was first enacted at PwC, I was very pleased to hear that because uh, that meant I didn't have to travel in crowded trains every morning. Uh, but sure, certainly when it happened, when um, work style changed abruptly uh, from um, office work to remote work, uh, we obviously had no idea how it's going to turn out. Uh, but uh, now um, a year has passed and uh, we actually know a lot about uh, remote work experience and a lot actually had turned out to be quite positive. Um, so let me touch on uh, three key findings uh, from a recent PwC survey on workplace. Um, so the first finding that we have is that companies that have adopted remote work technology and allowing flexibility, uh, that's for employees to manage family matters, have actually seen an increase in employee productivity. And some data points uh, suggest that 71% of employees say shift to remote work has been successful. Those are the employees. And 52% of employers say employee productivity has actually improved uh, than before the pandemic. Um, so the takeaway on this point is investing in tools and, te and technology is obviously important to enhance collaboration, uh, but also extending benefits uh, for childcare and measures on employee well-being are just as important. And uh, I'll share the second finding uh, from the survey, uh, which is that um, employers are ready for rapid return to the office in 2021, uh, but the employees feel differently. Um, so what I mean by that, um, the, data, the data point suggests 75% of the executives 
anticipate at least half of the workforce will return to the office by July, uh, this coming July. Uh, but uh, 61% of employees think that way. So there's a, there's a significant gap. And I think central to that point uh, is um, employers need to really think about the workspace configuration and make employees safe uh, to, to come back. And uh, the last finding I would share, uh, Eric, is, um, uh, is that um, a hybrid workplace um, uh, will actually be the norm going forward. Um, so here, the data points suggest 55% of employees say they prefer remote work at least three days a week, uh, even after the pandemic. Whereas 68% of employers believe employees need to be in the office at least three days a week. So there's a big, big gap here. And um, from an employer's perspective, and equally important to employees, is that um, the central concern here is maintaining a, a, cor a corporate culture. Um, so um, how does, um, so what's the um, um, message here is that companies need to be able to communicate what people can expect to accomplish at home and in the office. Um, and a central question here is what would be valuable enough to keep your employees coming into the office? So um, these are the key findings. And um, <clears throat> I think I've highlighted some gaps uh, between the employer and the employee uh, around uh, coming back to the office and about uh, remote work itself. Uh, but I think it's quite safe to say that remote work is not an aberration and uh, all of us need to make continual adjustments to embrace a hybrid, uh, uh, hybrid um, uh, work style. And I think um, for companies, uh, there's no reason uh, for, for taking no action uh, because the pandemic has clearly changed the way uh, people view about work and about how people value, value life. So back to you, Eric. Okay, thank you so much, Wei. That's so interesting how um, employees have been uh, more productive working remotely, and I would like to see what happens if um, the majority go back to the offices in Tokyo in, in July, and uh, what the how they measure out in terms of productivity if it if it can stay the same. Uh, thank you also for mentioning childcare. Um, we have an expert uh, with us today, uh, Michael. So here is. The first question for you, Michael, is um, with so many people working remotely from home, uh, how has that affected both the uh, family dynamic uh, and your business uh, for both uh, child care and then also senior care? Hi, um, Eric, thank you so much for your question. Um, so so we have different two different um, segment uh, that I can talk about. One is um, we actually run around about 322 nursery schools across Japan. So I can talk about the nursery school as in the people go to and then the, uh, the other services which we provide at home. And so in terms of the nursery schools, um, back in April last year, um, the government decided that um, it's we're going to prioritize essential workers within the um, within the system. So we'll have the children of the essential workers still coming to the nursery, but the other children who could actually stay at home with parents because the parents are working from home, um, they were to um, to 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 be to be at home, and so. For, for us, the mission was how do we then um, integrate those two different um, environments? Because for the children, they um, for them, their daily life all of a sudden was taken away. And so um, we sort of the way to connect um, both the, the children who's staying in a nursery and the children staying at home. So we introduced this, this system called online nursery programs. So just as how we uh, would start the morning, we will um, we'll have the Zoom um, Asanokai, which is the morning session at 8 a.m. 
welcoming all the children, um, calling upon um, each one of them um, to uh, start the day. And then so that they felt like they're still connected, even though they weren't there in the in same environment. And so that was very important, not just for the children. Obviously, children are essential, um, central to um, what we were trying to do, but also for the parents who all of, all of a sudden, um, they're, they're staying at home, the children staying at home, and the husband's also staying at home. And so the family dynamic was has changed abruptly for them. And so we started hearing a lot of um, a lot of sort of uh, feedbacks from the mothers, especially, saying that um, now that I have to stay at home, not only just to look after children, but to cook three times a day a meal for my husband, and also participate in Zoom meetings all day. And I just, you know, I can't do it. And so uh, what we tried to do then um, on the nanny service, babysitter service side, was that we, um, we set up an online nanny service too. And so for the children who's staying at home, um, who, you know, the age range from zero to 18 years old, um, we will provide sort of online tutoring um, so that they, we can look after um, their homework or assist in studying while the parents are doing Zoom meeting on the, in the other room. Um, or we will send our nannies to take uh, the children outside to play in a garden or in, um, in a park, because in Japan that was still allowed. Um, so I think what we used to think as childcare um, which had to be done face to face, had actually, um, well, it was challenged and it's changed throughout this one year. Um, and we've actually found, I just, um, uh, I was listening to uh, Wei San speaking about hybrid um, workplace. Well, I think for the service too, um, what we call essential service, that's um, also becoming hybrid. And this is to be continued um, for after COVID or what we, what we would like to actually call better normal um, that we're aiming to achieve. So um, that's on the childcare side and elderly care side, we also try to do um, similar things, but then um, what we found was that for the elderly care, it's more um, essential as in uh, the, just because we had COVID, it didn't mean that um, the family could all of a sudden then look after their parents or um, or the um, or, or their family at home without professional care. So we actually took extra measures uh, um, by taking PCR. At that time, the government wasn't providing the test adequately in Japan. So we um, we actually bought ourselves uh, the PCR from the company, and then we made sure that our care staff were protected in order to protect the um, the the clients that we were looking after, the elderly we were looking after at home. Yeah. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, I can relate to having the high stress environment at home with both parents trying to work and look after uh, the children. Uh, certainly in Hawaii, uh, a lot of the childcare in my experience will go to the uh, the grandparents. You know, there's a lot of multi-generational right. families here. And I know my parents were pretty tired, uh, you know, not even uh, halfway through COVID and maybe they loved their grandson, but it was quite trying for everybody. So, you know, thank you for all you do and providing those services. And uh, might have a chance for expansion here in Hawaii. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. Keep an eye out for you. Uh, next up, we have a question for uh, Akiko. Um, and uh, the first one is, uh, how has your business um, and the social networking scene and recruiting uh, in Japan uh, been affected uh, by COVID? Uh, thank you for your question. So let me start off with uh, explaining what's happening for uh, recruiting at recruiting industry in general in Japan. So I have seen observing uh, other competitors suffering, uh, dropping their revenue down to like 10 to 25% year on year. 
but uh, for Wantedly, we have we have, we have been doing uh, much better for I think mainly mainly two reasons. Uh, uh, actually, our revenue was up six percent year on year, even with, uh, during the COVID, even in the year of twenty twenty. And uh, one of the reasons is because uh, our business model is based on subscription model, whereas other major hiring platforms, recruiting platform, charge clients per uh, job post or per hire. So uh, this subscription model really stabled our revenue stream. And other reason I think is that because um, majority of our work, our customer bases are kind of uh, we are focusing on tech companies. And uh, I think because of this COVID situation, more and more demand for tech talents are kind of like surging. So it's actually uh, a good for our business. So uh, we are expecting to grow our business further this year, this fiscal year. And so that's uh, what we have been, the, the effects of COVID-19 in the past uh, one to two years. And additionally, uh, because of this COVID-19, I expected that hiring uh, demand will drop in 2020. So we started a new business where we focus more on after hire, meaning uh, before we were focusing on helping companies to hire talents, but every companies don't hire people to hire, to hire, right? They, they want to make those people, the new hires, uh, excel at their company and uh, they li deliver values. So we wanted to help comp those companies, our customers, to to increase engagement with their, their new hires. So we introduced new, uh, three new products. Uh, we launched it uh, during the COVID-19 uh, lockdown. And uh, one, so let me explain briefly. So one of it is called Pulse, which is a condition and performance management tools. Another is uh, called Perks, uh, one like Perks, where uh, employee employer can provide uh, various uh, different services with this with discount to their employees uh, without additional fee if they pay wantedly uh, monthly sub subscription fee already. And the last one is called uh, wantedly stories, which is a blog feature like internal internal blog where um, like me, for example, if I want to share my story with uh, all the staff, I can write it and uh, publish it and only people within the company can will be able to see it and also comment and like it and also will be distributed on Slack and email. So uh, that's like a, it was a really good way to communicate with uh, employees even during this difficult time. Because uh, before COVID, we used to host uh, all hands meeting once a week and I was able to see everyone's face, face physically, but uh, for over a year, uh, it's not happening. And I don't think it will happen even after the COVID-19 will, um, we will be over. So this new tool to facilitate the communication between uh, between employees and employees, and also uh, employers and employee is, uh, has been really effective for us as well. So after the launch of those new products, uh, after six months, we have over 400 companies using those tools already and it's growing faster. So uh, I think COVID has given a really good opportunity to build another uh, strong pillar of the business. So that's uh, my, <laughs> what, I, what, I, what I saw um, from the last two years. So I'll give back to Eric. <laughs> okay, no, thank you. That's so interesting. I, I need to, uh... Uh, schedule a separate time to ask you about your subscription model. That sounds quite, <laughs> quite attractive. Um, yeah, how innovative. And uh, since you mentioned that, you know, the, the tools and engagement, uh, I'm going to send it back to, to Wei. Um, there's this theme of technology, of course, emerging in all three of the sectors here, which is, which is amazing. So I'd like to go back to, to Wei um, and ask him, uh, you know, what is the advice uh, that you have for your clients, uh, executives, uh, to keep their employees, you know, um, productive, right? Well, whether it's right now or, or you know, later this year when they go back to the office. Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, Eric. Thank you. Um, so, 
the advice um, that, that that we have um, is also a whole true for um, what the, we do at PwC, but I think it um, um, has to do with um, um, executives uh, reinventing uh, the workplace, uh, thinking uh, what the holistic change uh, they can make um, to enhance um, use of technology, uh, but also um, to um, pay considerable attention to well-being of employees. And um, uh, three points um, uh, I would um, I would leave with everyone to think about is um, um, I think executives uh, should think about um, prioritizing uh, increase uh, to support flexible work models. Uh, and that is um, uh, the hybrid model where people, um, you know, can work remotely and come to the office and make that coexist. And um, certainly uh, to be able to do that, the second point would be to invest in office configuration, uh, to continue to um, embrace technology and develop tools uh, to really manage the complexity of hybrid workplace. And that is the key to uh, staying productive. And uh, the last point is um, um, to place more attention uh, on the well-being of people and begin thinking about um, uh, creating good work uh, for societal progress. And that's a much higher calling. And it leads to ultimately uh, about uh, having a, a very distinct purpose um, of uh, what the company uh, is um, uh, is all about uh, in the large society, in the large society, um, so that uh, employees um, can feel uh, that connection uh, between work, company, and uh, the society at large. Uh, thank you, Wei. Um, just as a follow up, you know, on that idea of of wellness and and taking care of the employees. Um, have you seen an increase of the kind of facilities, whether it's, um, you know, a gym or, I don't know, yoga plans or, or just other, maybe even special food delivery services in, in the States? Of course, everyone is, is trying to get fit, whatnot, um, separate from COVID. But a lot of the leading companies here in Honolulu, one of their selling points is, hey, we'll give you a free gym membership uh, or we have a really nice gym or we're gonna bring in a meditation teacher once a week, things like that. How is that um, in the Tokyo landscape? Um, I think, I think uh, certainly um, um, the membership, I, I have not heard in the Tokyo landscape, <laughs> but um, um, I'll take uh, PwC for example. Uh, we just opened up uh, a new office in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, you know, it's a uh, brave timing to do so, but we did. And um, um, a, a lot of it is to bring our um, uh, practices together uh, in a um, uh, very, you know, uh, close proximity, uh, almost next to each other. And what we did um, in, um, in in being um, sort of attractive and being staying true to um, uh, to well-being is um, we configured the uh, office space. Uh, to make sure that um, uh, it induces collaboration, uh, to make sure that um, uh, there's, um, uh, for example, cafes um, that are, you know, uh, sizable uh, for people to uh, both relax, uh, enjoy a cup of coffee, uh, but uh, also, uh, you know, being able to uh, sort of commingle uh, with colleagues uh, formally and informally. Uh, in a very relaxed uh, setting. So uh, that's one example of what um, uh, we have done in, in PwC Japan. Um, but I, I'm sure other employ employers uh, are thinking of different ways uh, to, um, uh, to, to care about um, uh, the well-being. Uh, yesterday, for example, I just read that uh, one of the uh, biggest Japanese chemical companies uh, have uh, uh, implemented uh, a policy uh, for actually employees uh, to exercise rights of um, not um, um, subject uh, to um, um, uh, to I guess mobility programs. So there's a rotation uh, program in Japan where people uh, are asked to uh, 
um, you know, go to uh, different locations, move to different locations. And it um, traditionally has been a part of um, working for Japanese companies. Uh, so now employers, employer is giving the right for employee to refuse uh, uh, without stating any reasons, um, you know, to, to stay put and uh, not, uh, not move according to company policy. So I think that's one example of well-being that I read recently uh, that is quite different and unique. And I think uh, it could be viewed as a, a very a distinct change uh, from traditional Japanese um, uh, company environment. Great, thank you for that, Wei. Um, let's switch over uh, back to, to Maiko. And uh, may I ask you, Maiko, how has the uh, classification and kind of the understanding uh, of the essential worker uh, changed, you know, in this in this last year? Thank you. Um, so I think up till now, um, essential workers, uh, um, we, we talk about medical staff and, and people who work um, in those sort of front line um, in hospitals. Um, but for us, we have over 5,000 uh, staff who's working in a nursery school and in elderly care. And it was, it was really important for us to be able to um, understand that we too are essential workers and to, to have that understanding. Um, I think what Wei San was saying that why we do what we do today was very important. So we do this because we need to support the children and the elderly of the essential workers, um, i.e. Um, medical, uh, medical staff and people on the front line, um, in order for, for them to be able to do their job we also need to do our part. And so I think um, we, for the past year and a half, we really tried to make sure that they understood why and that we as pop-ins, we are protecting them on a daily basis so that they can do their job um, uh, in, a lab well, in a labor intensive sort of um, industry. So um, what we did, um, we actually introduced this system on a daily basis since last year. Every day, the staff has to check their temperature, um, if they're wearing the right kind of mask, um, if they don't have um, any sort of conditions that they're concerned about. Um, this is all coming in a Google sort of format on a daily basis so that 5,000 employees, they check that every day and we monitor that very carefully. And if there's any sort of issues or what we um, that we notice that it's it's actually taken care of straight away, and that includes not just the physical part, but also for the sort of the mental part as well. In any stress they're feeling, if they're feeling um, scared or you know um, any any of sort of um, the emotional part, we uh, we also. Uh, made sure that we were taking care of that um, and then also we made sure that they felt like they um, they can take a break that it wasn't going to be too stressful to the extent that they felt like they needed to um, be at work um, regardless of how they felt and so we made sure that they um, that they could you know anytime they felt unwell or that uneasy they were able to work from home. Even the, the staff on the ground, they could stay at home and they could do online nursery program or they could um, you know, create different sort of storytelling board. Um, there are a lot of things that they could, they could do at home, which we didn't really realize before. And so we allowed for that. And also um, in terms of facility, we changed um, our nursery school um, quite a bit in a sense that everything, um, we tried to bring in everything that was not, um, to make sure that it was um, non-contactable. So um, thermometer, we used to actually have those very old fashioned one where you put it underneath your arm, but everything now in uh, 300 nurseries, we have a non-contact thermometer which is actually attached to the iPad so that um, the, the actual measurement will go straight into the iPad. So it's actually um, made uh, work a lot easier for the staff 
um, to be able to monitor children's temperature. We've also brought in automatic um, non-contact uh, alcohol dis disinfectant um, so that it, uh, you know, it lessened sort of the, uh, how the children or the parents had to, um, had to touch those things, which could actually um, spread uh, the risk of uh, um, COVID-19. So we've, we've taken in a lot of measures uh, to make sure that the parents and the children and the staff felt safe to come to the nursery. And even though you needed to social distance and even though you needed to wear a mask, you needed to be careful that within the nursery, it's one of the safest place to be during this period. I think that was what we were trying to, to accomplish. And I think through that, we've, we've come out with something um, much better than what we used to do before. So hopefully, even after this era um, COVID, with, with COVID sort of period, um, we've learned a lot of new way of doing things, which will continue on to the new hybrid, um, better way of doing things for the future. Um, so in the end, I think at the end of the day, it's very important to be scared, but scared in the right way with the right information, with the right support system. And I think that goes the same for the parents who's also staying at home. That's great. And yeah, no, thank you so much, Michael. Um, very interesting. Um, I wanna shift again back to Akiko. Um, you know, when I was recruiting in Tokyo, one of the frustrations I had was our clients always wanted the candidates to be uh, fluent Japanese speakers, uh, even if they were, you know, tech people, and even if it was a gaishke, a foreign company, or a Japanese uh, company. Just curious, Akiko, ha has that changed uh, just from a language perspective? And the follow-up to that is, how about, um, you know, the big Japanese companies, are they at all hiring remote workers, you know, in the States or Europe or elsewhere um, because of COVID or even before COVID? Right. Um, I personally think <laughs> the situation hasn't really changed. Uh, larger enterprises still have their core uh, procedure done in Japanese. All the documents are in Japanese. So I think it'll be hard to hire somebody who doesn't speak Japanese or read Japanese. But uh, for niche market like a tech industry, I think um, talents like engineers and designers, those people might have a better chance getting a job without having a skills, language skills. Um, yeah, personally, actually, uh, during COVID la pandemic last, uh, last year, we launched uh, this mini site called getintouch.me. And I, we reached out to uh, some of the designers in Ukraine and uh, we never met whenever we only had a communication on Slack, but we were able to um, success successfully launch product uh, with a great design they provided. And uh, that was a really good experience. I felt like, you know, everyone is still, everyone is working remotely now. So even if your colleagues live in Japan or Ukraine, uh, it doesn't really matter. So, I personally felt like uh, there's a potential where uh, companies in Japan will be able to collaborate more, you know, better with uh, talents outside of Japan. But again, uh, in general, for large enterprises, I think it's still early. Uh, some of the large, some of the companies like Rakuten, I think they try to, um, you know, transform themselves to speak English as a first language internally, and maybe those companies uh, may have. <laughs> uh better chance that's what i think right understood and from what i recall you know 20 25 years ago there were very few uh fluent uh japanese uh gaijin in in tokyo and even in the banking world these days from what i hear from friends uh, even you know executives or traders at, at goldman sachs or other places speak fluent japanese because either they're they grew up in Tokyo or they, they just learned it in school. So that's such a changing <laughs> uh, uh, dynamic, you know, and it makes it so competitive. Uh, what uh, other than, are there, um, I guess, uh, 
a different type of candidate or demographic coming into Japan these days, whether it's uh, Southeast Asia with Indonesians or Vietnamese, or wh where do you see, you know, maybe five years down the line, if, if there's a next uh, pipeline of, of folks coming into Tokyo, uh, where do you think they might be coming from? Mm. <laughs> um, I'm not really sure how this immigrants uh, policy will play out in long term. Uh, in general, I think Japanese society is really um, reluctant to, you know, welcome those immigrants from other countries, uh, wanting more Japanese people to, uh, you know, the labor force is in decline, is a sharp decline. So everyone knows that we have to provide more labor force. But I think in general, Japanese societies is hoping to uh, get more out of female women and elderly people. And so that will be the first priority. And uh, and I, <laughs> I, my expertise is more focused on tech industry. So I, I cannot really speak for uh, essential workers like other, I don't know, food and beverages, like other labor intensive industries. But for those areas, I observe a lot of uh, non-Japanese workers for example, like if I go to convenience stores, 90% uh, of the people that, that, you know, that I see there are from like China or other Southeast Asia countries. So um, yeah, I think it will be like bipolarism. Uh, one you know, sector will be filled with uh, people from outside Japan and other maybe like tech sector or uh, I don't know. <laughs> sector where Japanese skill set is important, uh, more Japanese will be there and more female and elder people will be deployed there. Um, this is not uh, sh shifting away from your question, but uh, another trend that I'm seeing, which I think interesting is that the biggest one of the biggest issues in Japan right now is uh, scarce uh, talents of engineers. So engineers lacking. I mean, this is a, you know, the whole, um, this problem is happening every all over the world, not only in Japan, also in, in the US or other parts of the world as well. But uh, simply, you know, the university is not educating enough engineers. And I, what I'm observing is that uh, people from non-tech background, for example, like people who waited table at restaurants or who nursed elderly at nursing home, those people are changing careers. They're wanting to make more money. So they're entering this uh, boot camp. And um, <laughs> we have seen like surge of many users joining monthly to get jobs, uh, entry level jobs with, with like lower pay, but you know, eventually they will get higher pay in long term. So this um, shift of labor force from uh, like declining in industry to uh, this growing industry will be uh, really essential for Japanese uh, growth uh, as an economy. Right, no, thank you so much. And even in Hawaii, if I mention a candidate is, uh, needs a visa sponsorship, they give me, you know, that look, like, are you kidding? You know, so <laughs> we, have a, we have a long way to go um, on our side as well. Uh, but thank you so much. Um, I know we're gonna be heading into um, questions from our audience uh, very soon, but I do wanna have one more question for, for Maiko. Um, I saw in, in the news uh, maybe a week or two ago an article about uh, the government is making the uh, registration of uh, babysitting firms uh, more stringent due to some issues that popped up. Uh, could you share, you know, just a, a brief summary and your thoughts on that, please? Sure. Um, thank you. So basically, um, we're um, we're very much sort of a, we've been in the business for about thirty four years, uh, and so. The norm has been that there's always um, an agency or a company that's in the middle who is actually making sure that all the regulations are followed and that babysitters or nannies are well trained before they're actually sent to um, individual home to look after children. However, um, recently there's been a surge of um, obviously platforms um, coming from internet industry um, who's actually making, um, so the platform, i.e. almost, um, I mean, I wouldn't like to call it in a um, different way, but what, what so-called dating site. Um, so it's almost like where the individuals meet 
without really being able to check the background um, and all the training. So the quality of the care. And then uh, unfortunately there has been um, seven or eight incidents from the same company where there's been um, sexual molestation for the children and that wasn't regulated. And so I think the government realized, and the worst of it is, was that um, it was actually um, the, the platform that was in question was given um, okay. authorization from uh, the cabinet office to have a subsidy or well, the babysitter coupon. And so obviously I think um, the users believed that it was qualified to provide the service which wasn't um, actually the case. And so now they have, um, uh, well, they're, they're trying to resolve that issue now. So I think that's the reason why they've decided that um, we in Japan, I mean, we have not been used to um, having those sort of um, platform services where we're dealing with life. So we're dealing with children's lives where, um, whereby you know if no qualifications are checked or the sort of the sexual um you know the the background of the um the person who's actually providing the services checked properly um you know we're not mature enough um just yet in order to take it, that individual responsibility and then i think that's why the government's stepping in and i think it's really important because for the working mothers in Japan, there's not been much choice in terms of if they wanted to go back to work. So what sort of choices did they have in order to look after children? They only had nursery school or maybe kindergarten, but kindergarten, they, you know, the hours are short. And so really the only choice they had was nursery schools and the nursery schools, unfortunately, used to offer very minimum service um, which didn't fit everybody's lifestyle or the way that way of working um, especially now <coughs> that this diversified way of working is promoted in Japan so even early in the morning even on the day where your child has a temperature in the morning two hours later you need to you need to attend a meeting what do you do so you need to have a variety of quality services available for the female workforce um, to be able to, to actually uh, go back into the society and, and contribute in the workforce. So um, it's, it's just, I think we're, we're on the road to make sure that we'll have that variety of service, but there has to be a proper regulation so that it doesn't become a hindrance um for uh for promoting that sort of uh you know how how the female workforce should should go back into into work so it's a really it's a difficult complicated question um or the the trend that we're seeing at the moment um but i think first and foremost it has to be a trusted partner to be able to provide that sort of service. Otherwise it becomes um, a hindrance, so. Thank you so much. I know many couples here and, and around the world, you know, they don't go out much because they don't uh, trust the options that are available. So thank you for, you know, providing a safe place and a service um, for everyone. Uh, we do have uh, some questions from our audience. So I'm gonna start uh, with one uh, from Laura. Uh, and I guess I'll um, ask uh, Wei if he can um, step in on this one. Uh, do you think Japan will embrace uh, telework and hybrid models in a non-pandemic setting? Uh, to what extent do you think the traditional face-to-face -face, uh, in-person requirement uh, is changing? Oh, thank you, Eric. You hear me okay? Yes. Okay. I have trouble putting my video back on. Um, so let me just take the answer. Um, um, yeah, I, I think that's, um, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think to a certain extent, it depends on the sector that you're in. Um, certainly, um, in a professional services sector, I think, um, 
uh, hybrid uh, remote work uh, can stay um, even after pandemic. Um, I think for certain other sector, it may be challenging. Uh, but I think for Japan at large, um, the challenge is um, actually uh, commitment um, from, from uh, the, the um, senior management. Uh, I think uh, I've seen a lot of um, uh, companies, Japanese companies, that is, um, um, that um, uh, because senior level uh, senior level executives uh, tend to go into the office, uh, they tend to like working in the office. Uh, it induces uh, all, everyone else uh, below to go into the office. Right. So if um, you know um, they can the executives can become a role model uh, to uh, embrace um, remote work, then I think uh, there will be um, uh, a much higher chance of um, uh, hybrid work uh, as an alternative, um, even after pandemic. Thank you, Wei. Yeah, that's interesting because a few of my uh, biggest clients here, the executive teams are are in the office uh, and expected to be in the office, but they're telling their teams it's okay to work from home. So, yeah, <laughs> um, just I don't know. Maybe some of them are on this this call. Um, I'll, I'll take another question here um, for uh, Akiko uh, from Jonathan. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, during uh, his time working and living in Tokyo, he saw the best uh, and worst of recruiting. Uh, sometimes recruiters look at you uh, like a piece of meat. Um, what is the best advice for young people in terms of avoiding these experiences and how to position themselves competitively, uh, especially for new grads uh, looking to work uh, in Japan? Thank you for the question. Uh, do you refer, are you referring to uh, foreign talents working, trying to get a job in Japan as a new grad or think so. Japanese? Yes. Okay. Hmm. <laughs> right. So, like I mentioned earlier, in general, it's I think harder for uh, non-Japanese speaking talents to get a job in Japan. So, our company, Wantly, we hire non-Japanese uh, employee employees. Uh, we have like over I think six or seven non-Japanese staff in Tokyo office. We also have uh, uh, local staff in Singapore and Hong Kong. But uh, for most of the employees working in Japan, uh, we require like at least some Japanese speaking level. So that way uh, they'll be able to communicate and um, streamline all the work with the local Japanese staff in Tokyo office. So, uh, but we also have non-Japanese non speaking uh, staff in Tokyo and those are all engineers. So <laughs> one advice, uh, it might not be much helpful, help to everyone, but if you can code, <laughs> Coding is like one of the biggest, uh, you know, most most wanted talents or skill sets these days, and it will be for another, I, th I think, ten years. So, um, yeah, if you polish your <laughs> coding skill, I think you have like much better chance of getting job in Japan. Yeah. <laughs> or anywhere. Yeah, it's a great skill. Anywhere. Plan. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, and then one last question here for, for Michael um, from Steve. Thank you, Steve. Uh, how do you use technology uh, to coordinate shifts among your qualified staff? Uh, in essence, how do you combat the push of platforms that utilize technology to lower costs? Right. Um, so uh, in order to do a shift, so basically, um, we have actually built um, a division called DX um, back in 2020. And so it's digital transformation um, division. And that's um, underneath sort of my, um, my responsibility. And so that's how we started doing online nursery programs and things like that. So I believe our industry is very behind in utilizing IT, IoT, AI, but DX. Um, so I think um, we're very much at the forefront. Um, Poppins has always uh, tried uh, to make sure that we bring in all these IoT 
or IT system to make sure that the our staff can concentrate on what they're supposed to be doing rather than um, everything um, just because it's not being digitalized or IT or, or you know, being uh, in, uh, the IT is not being implemented. And so to answer the question, all our shifts are done on uh, within our own pop-in system that we've, um, we've developed um, over the years. And we are starting to collect data through AI to make sure that we can visualize, okay, so if how many children are here, how many staff are needed during what sort of season and sort of during what sort of hour. And so we're actually looking at it in a very sort of um, uh, very scientific way. Um, we used to be all done manually. And so uh, that's to answer that shift question. And in order to answer for that platform, I think it's, I welcome um, any sort of um, technology or platform or a new uh, way of doing the service, as long as the essential part, how do we make sure that we protect our mission, basically, to safely look after children, safely look after elderly. And so if we can bring about the technology to make sure that that can be delivered through platform, through um, online system, um, you know, I think that's that's all uh, that's all what we need to to try and aim to do. And so, we've actually bought a company a few years back from a game company called Gri, and so it's called Poppin Sitter. And so that everything is done online. And the differences are though, it's not C to C, but it's C to B to C. So it's although everything is very easy and um, that the client and the sitter have a choice on right. their own. We're in the middle to make sure that at the end of the day, there's a backup system. Yeah. That's great. I'm, sure, I'm not sure if I'm, I've answered all the questions, but. Uh, no, that, that, was, that was very helpful. And um, I know we're coming up uh, toward the end of the hour and I, I wanna thank the panelists and the audience for joining. I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Suzanne again uh, for the closing remarks. Great, thank you so much, Eric. And uh, thank you, Akiko, Maiko, and Wei for that discussion. And you know, this is the part where I come in and I, I try to wrap up what you said, but it was just, there's so much there uh, that it's challenging to, to bring it all together in one quick uh, summary. But I will say what I found was, as I was listening to you, how incredibly important as we get back to a better normal, as you said, uh, how important it is to have empathetic leadership as well as innovation. And I think that we heard a lot of that from, from your examples, from your own companies. But in the end, what, it, what I was listening to and hearing was how important culture is. And, um, you know, Akiko, you talked about the engagement with the new hires and way you talked a lot about the, the culture. And then Michael brought it into the home. You have the work culture and the home culture to think about. And I was really taken by the gap that Wei pointed out between how employers and employees look at the um, work at home versus working in the office. And what that, what that means, I think, in terms of having inclusive conversations with your employees and also providing the right kind of environment and technology um, to address everybody's needs. So I thought this was really, really helpful. And so I think the final piece that I'm going to take away as I think through these things is the importance that Wei reminded us of, of making sure we focus on purpose and thinking about how do we connect our work to society. And I think I've heard um, Maiko and Akiko talk about that as well in, in different ways. Um, so I think that's kind of the key takeaway for us as we think about applying digital transformation to our workplaces. So thank you very much for this uh, conversation. Thank you for everybody who's here and then for the questions. We hope everyone who joined us today um, will consider getting more involved in USJC if you're not already involved. Um, you can subscribe to our newsletter, follow us on social media, join us in future events, encourage your company to be a sponsor if they're not already, or consider making a deduction yourself um, to allow us to continue to do the work that we're doing. And thank you to everybody who has supported us in the recent months. Um, lastly, I just want to let people know about our next upcoming virtual event, which is very aligned with this topic. It's our work from anywhere future. Um, and this is being organized by our members. So it'll be organized by our Hawaii and our California members. Uh, and I think a lot of it is people who are interested in trying to get to Hawaii to work from Hawaii. 
Um, but anyway, exploring some of the options there from the member's perspective, and you can see the information on your screen. So hope you'll join us. Thank you everybody for being with us today. And again, thank you so much to the speakers for um, your great presentations and very um, uh, information uh, loaded uh, discussion. Thanks.